Good morning and welcome to this year's Kent Property Market Report. Uh, slightly different format to, to usual. I'm Mark Coxon, uh, Head of Agency at Caxton's. So I'll be doing a short presentation on an agent's perspective of the market. Uh, my colleague Charlotte Laherty uh, will be talking about the code of practice for commercial property relationships during the COVID period 2020. I'm not going to say too much about COVID. Um, the industrial market in particular stalled just for a very short time and then following uh, Boris's um, relaxation on the lockdown uh, two months ago it all took off again so actually the market's been very buoyant uh, the investment market on in, on investments has, um, has rallied also um, the office market which we'll go on to shortly um, has suffered but um, only in uh, slightly different size ranges I'd like to talk you around the uh, the Kent, uh, Kent market through my map here. Uh, Kent's very lucky. We've got uh, uh, a number of larger schemes which can accommodate units of uh, warehouse units of uh, circa 500,000 square feet. Bowcote Tritax, uh, powerhouse at Littlebrook to accommodate 450,000 square foot. Uh, the Goodman scheme at London Medway Park, uh, where we also have planning for, for that size. G Park in Sittingbourne, and then moving down to uh, to Panatoni, then at Aylesford, Panatoni Park, uh, which 90 acres was acquired uh, for, for large units. Dartford um, in the last 12 months has performed particularly well. Um, the most recent practical completion this month will be Newables at Dartford Trading Estate, uh, where Newables are building out five units of 73,000 square feet. Uh, this follows uh, Dartford X, where Renbridge and Railpen have uh, recently got planning and moving on to construct five units uh, to accommodate up to 185,000 square foot. Uh, Renbridge similarly, radial 74, 74,000 square foot and orbital 47, 47,000 square foot. A large acquisition last year was again by Goodman at Crossways uh, to accommodate three buildings up to 240,000 square feet. So moving around Kent, M2 City Link, which will be the uh, next uh, practical completion, uh, very successful in the letting of Selco uh, this year. Uh, Hermes funded location threes, Medway City Link, to construct up to 102,000 square foot, where we can accommodate uh, in one building 73,000 square feet. Moving on to the London Medway Park at the Rochester Goodman scheme, following on from Amazon's 300,000 square foot pre-let last year, uh, Goodman has successfully uh, pre-let to Notum Logistics, 150,000 square foot with practical completion at the end of this year. Uh, Trilogy Sittingbourne, uh, Martin Smith at Tavis House, funded by Barwood Capital, uh, is building out 80,000 square feet in three buildings. Uh, G Park we discussed, and one of the largest mid-box deals this year going eastwards um, on the George, by George Wilson, Lakesview at Hurston, where Global Freight Logistics have taken 60,000 square feet. Waterbrook Park in Ashford, moving down south, uh, GSE can accommodate buildings to, uh, on a site of 16.5 acres. And don't forget Mojo, which was the 27 acre site uh, available, bought last year, uh, so I bought this year um, by the government uh, for truck parking and that takes out potentially 1.2 million square feet of industrial warehousing. Moving back up uh, the M20, uh, one of the major or probably one of the only land deals uh, during Covid was the purchase of Woodcut Farm by Clearbell, uh, 33 acres to accommodate uh, mid-box warehouse units, bought off Rock Seal Seagrove. Moving forward on Rock on, um, Cold Harbour Lane, Aylesford, Rembridge building out three units of 43, 50 and 114,000 square feet. Uh, this is to complement uh, their scheme at Ark in Aylesford, uh, which they'll be building out 120,000 square foot with one free let already at 20,000 square foot hitting 10 pounds per square foot. Palatoni Park, which we've mentioned also, is always there, also there. Finally, moving eastwards, we've got um, Goya, uh, uh, PCing this month, um, two units of 37 and 65,000 square foot um, over there in, in Orpington and Goya also building out in Aylesford. Chancery Gate are very rep well represented in Kent with schemes in Rochester, Crossways, Orpington, Sidcup and Tonbridge. I'd like to mention the trade parks as well. Trade parks have been 
a bit of a phenomenon, uh, increasing rents over the years uh, to way above industrial. Uh, Gravesend, Kia Trade Parks are building out five units uh, with three lettings, Medway City Estate. Um, we have uh, a number of trade, trade units. Rootham for Walborough, we're doing that uh, near Seven Oaks. And Canterbury, Stair Valley Estates, we've just got planning permission on a small tra trade park. Interesting, interesting to see rents over the last year have increased by £14.70 uh, to £9.70, sorry, 14% to £9.70, which is an increase of 32% over three years and 96 per year. Industrial rents throughout Kent are now hitting double digit um, for the new build and exceeding this in Dartford at 1450. Um, in most locations on new build, we're hitting well above £10 per square foot. Moving on to land values, you can see um, Aylesford a million with a Panettone deal, 90 acres. Dartford's hitting 2 million, Orpington 3. Although no deals have been done in Rochester, uh, quoting figures for land will be in the region of 1 million, uh, Seven Oaks 1.5. Sittingbourne's quite an interesting one at 0.6 or oh, just over half a million. Uh, last year, uh, Caxton's represented Doka, buying seven acres for their HQ building, a 40,000 square foot new build, paying 450,000. We paid circa 550 um, for Tavis House uh, for their new unit scheme. And we hear that uh, Sittingbourne's now hit 650. So Sittingbourne is still slightly underpriced uh, for Kent in general. Um, and don't forget Ashford, where um, Land values uh, have increased from 550 to 650, similar to Sittingbourne, and I think there's some more scope there. Quite disappointing figures last year. Uh, this year will be uh, along the same lines, um, although if you take out the, uh, the Ashford Mojo site at 1.5 million, this increases the figures quite, quite, quite significantly. A very good investment market over the last uh, 12 months with um, Aylesford uh, seeing most of the investment deals. M7 purchasing Mills Road, 33 million, 5.23%. Uh, Aberdeen Standard, Burnt Ash Trading Estate, uh, it's 4.7% um, uh, yield, 13 million. Eton College, 3.8 million, 6% at Sheldon Way. Patizia, this is probably the largest uh, COVID investment deal done off market in Quarrywood, purchasing 417,000 square foot. Marchmont IM purchasing Quarrywood at 5.5%, 48,000 square foot. And Legal in General purchasing Mills Road at 6%, um, 3.8 million. And these are a mixture of single let and multi let. The investment deal last year, which I think probably appeared in last year's Kent Property Market Report, was the Quadrant uh, Dartford uh, Multilet sold to Aberdeen for 4.25, uh, secured by a 20-year lease to Network Rail, which is very similar to a, uh, to, to a bond. <clears throat> but notwithstanding that, with Multilet yields, as you look on the black line, at 4.5%, we can see a lot better than that. Distribution at 6, but that's just a, a general. Um, and just comparing this to things happening in East London, Electra in Canning Town has just been bought by Seagull of Schroeder's 228,000 square foot of industrial um, let at 2.58%. So we're very close to Canning Town, so we can see rents uh, yields are going to fantastic levels. Um, the funds are all very acquisitive in Kent, trying to find uh, both vacant and part let stock. Uh, with funding yields of five to five and a half percent. So moving on to the office and business park market. Uh, in business parks, um, there's been a five percent increase over the last five years in rents. Uh, the main business parks throughout the county are letting well. Gillingham Business Park almost 100 uh, percent let, uh, with Fred Needle being the owners. Although there has been a 40,000 square foot office owned by Lloyd's. Uh, come to the market, which might not be sold for um, offices, but obviously might go for different use. Kent Science Park having one of the biggest office lettings this year, um, 15,000 square foot let to Optiva. Crossways letting well. Kings Hill, which always has 
um, a number of larger deals, maybe smaller sub 10,000 square foot this year. They, they have seen the largest uh, investment sale, 98,000 square feet, one and two Kings Hill Avenue, uh, sold at 6.97%. Further east, we've got Ashford M7 buying Eureka, 15,000 square foot investment at 9.8%, which seems good value, bought off Trinity College uh, and completed just during COVID. Uh, office rents in general have increased by 30% over the last five years from quite a low base. And this has particularly been due to lack of stock where many offices, especially in Maystone, have been converted to, um, to residential. Two very big deals in the office front in Kent this year, um, Oak Hill House in Seven Oaks, um, was sold to Barclay Homes, uh, 100,000 square feet. And similarly, uh, Watman House, nice to see a, an office building actually sold as an office building, 27,000 square foot, sold for 6 million. As you can see, the yields uh, for Multilet, uh, got about 5.5% uh, to business parks uh, to 7% with um, yields uh, decreasing a multi-let, probably to, uh, to near the sub four, and uh, as we've seen from Electra, even less. Just looking at UK generally, obviously rental growth uh, has been negative, but notwithstanding that, Kent has seen a 14% increase in prime industrial rents in the last uh, 12 months. Um, so most rents, as I've said, uh, are hitting uh, 10 pounds per square foot. And, and the uh, average primary yield has increased by 30% over the last five years for offices. The outlook for industrial, um, there will be an increase in stock due to the amount of development pipeline, but this is due to the, there'll be a lack of land which will frustrate this, um, but we will be seeing rent, rental increases. For offices and business parks, we'll be seeing smaller floor plates uh, with companies possibly moving out of London with uh, an increase in rents. So a very positive story for Kent on his industrial office and business parks. And now over to my colleague, Charlotte, who will be discussing the, uh, the next part of the report. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just going to open up my presentation. Sorry for the uh, delay. There you go. Hopefully, you can all see that now. Um, anyway, good morning. Yeah, thanks for all coming so early. Um, and thanks to Mark for, uh, for his talk there. I'm just going to um, go over now the uh, code of practice for commercial property relationships during the COVID pandemic. Um, just to give you um, a bit of an introduction to me, I'm, I'm Charlotte Laherty. I'm the director responsible for the commercial management um, department in Caxton's. Uh, we act primarily for investors, um, investor landlords, overseeing the uh, management of a diverse range of, of commercial property. Um, and this includes about 1300 business tenancies operating within retail, hospitality, um, leisure, office and industrial sectors, um, predominantly in Kent, but across the, the wider southeast area too. Um, I'm going to, sorry, there you go. Um, as I say, I'm going to talk to you about this code that the, uh, the government have now introduced. Um, just to give you some background on it, I'm sure you're well aware, but obviously, uh, obviously to put it in context a bit, early to mid-March uh, 2020, obviously we saw some companies uh, were starting to see business slow down. Um, those particularly affected relied on elderly customers in particular, or were located in areas where there were a largely older demographic. Um, and at that point, this group of people had started becoming more nervous about going out. And we saw that some tenants were struggling very early on as a result, um, with sales falling even prior to, to lockdown being introduced. Um, the government closed down the entertainment, hospitality and, and indoor leisure sector on the 20th of March. And obviously non-essential retail closed a few days later. Um, and the standard quarter rent day for commercial property fell due five days after that on the 25th of March. So you had many businesses forced to close. Um, and as a managing agent, we became inundated with requests for, from tenants for rent concessions, uh, deferrals, holidays and the like. Uh, 
Um, many tenants sought to agree mutually satisfactory payment plans with their landlords or move towards monthly payments to assist with cash flow. Um, but a significant, unfortunately, um, predominantly large corporate tenants uh, simply failed to pay the quarterly rent at all. Um, some landlords were, were supportive of their tenants, um, not, you know, some not as much. The graph shown on the screen now shows the impact of this on rent collection levels. Um, it shows how, you know, much rent was collected for each sector um, by 14 days after the due date. So the blue column being the March 2020 quarter, the orange June and the grey September. Um, and you can see that across all sectors, collection levels hover around the 55% mark for each quarter. Um, there are some nuances between the different sectors with offices having outperformed industrial and retail, quite surprisingly, um, on average, um, and having finished up around 61% of rent collection at the 14 day mark after the last quarter. Um, retail, unsurprisingly, has been the worst affected from the outset, starting around 45%. Um, but it, it has seen the largest improvement across the course of the year um, by almost 10% to about the 54% mark um, by September, albeit the sector still finishes at a lower level than the two others. Um, the numbers continue to improve as we move through the quarter where it reached just below the 70% mark um, by the 60 day point at March and in June. Um, and we expect to see the same hopefully in September with many tenants still behind on payments um, or having reached agreement to pay in instalments throughout the quarter. So hopefully we should see um, a slow increase as time moves on. But in a bid to safeguard those tenants who were genuinely suffering as a result of the lockdown measures um, against aggressive rent collection tactics by their landlords, the government introduced protection by way of a moratorium on forfeiture proceedings in the Coronavirus Act. Um, the Act ensures that leases cannot be forfeited basically for non-payment of REM for a three month period for all types of commercial tenants, but still allows for forfeiture at the end of the period for non-payment. This works to encourage businesses that are in a position to, to make their rent payment to do so whilst providing three months grace to those that are struggling. So initially um, it meant that landlords can seek possession or even threaten it as a means to collect rent until the 30th of June. Um, that's subsequently been extended. The main issue was that there was still a large proportion of tenants who probably did have the means to pay um, at least some, if not all of their quarterly rent at that point in time, but, it, but they'd failed to do so with the protection of the moratorium. Um, there were also a number of landlords, of course, seeking to pursue those who potentially couldn't meet their liabilities. Um, and of course, the next possible remedy was an order for winding up. Um, you've no doubt heard of the Travel Lodge case, along with some other high street names such as Boots, Matalan and Pound Stretcher, um, being discussed in the press a lot over the last few months. Um, these were tenants who had declined to pay rents on some or all of their premises. Um, but many landlords and, um, you know, even the media felt this was unjustified when these companies had traded so successfully up until this point, um, had strong balance sheets. And also by now, the government had announced a whole raft of financial support measures to assist them. Um, some had even been able to remain open and trading under the essential retail category, albeit income in some cases had undoubtedly reduced with lower levels of footfall generally. Nonetheless, the government could clearly foresee a surge in statutory demands, given this was now one of the few remedies available to landlords. And consequently, on the 23rd of April, they announced that the use of stat demands and winding up petitions would be restricted um, to essentially safeguard the high street against aggressive debt recovery actions during the pandemic. Um, whilst the strap line to the measure was referred to the UK High Street, the provision to implement them, which are inc included in the Corporate Insolvency and Governance Bill, um, is not sector sp specific, so it applies to any registered or unregistered company that can be the subject of a winding up petition. Um, the restrictions applied initially for a period from the 27th of April to the 30th of June, uh, but they've now, well, they've since been extended along with the moratorium on forfeiture proceedings until the end of the year, so until the 30th of December. Um, the final now in the coffin for landlords with plans to pursue tenants um, came in the suspension on the use of enforcement agents, so, um, you know, more commonly known as bailiffs. Taking control of, of goods and, uh, and certification of enforcement agents regulations prevented landlords from using this remedy unless an amount of at least 90 days rent was due when it had previously been seven days or more. And again, this has since been increased to at least 276 days rent. Um, and this restriction also now applies until the 30th of December, 
um, or such later date as, as may be specified in the regulations. So as it stands, we've got landlord remedies for rent collection now substantially limited um, as still a large number of tenants who can't meet their rental obligations under their lease. Um, and this is where the code comes in. Um, and it's, it's been endorsed by a number of industry bodies, including the British Chamber of Commerce, the Royal Institution of Charter Surveyors and, and the British Property Federation, amongst others. Um, but it was introduced on the 19th of June, just a few days before the next quarter day um, on the 24th. And it does make clear that, that the restrictions on the recovery of rent are exceptional, but they are time limited and they exist to provide tenants with breathing space to, to work with their landlords towards a sustainable future. Um, the code they hope will encourage best practice mutually beneficial agreements to become common practice. Um, but an important point to note is that it is a voluntary code and it does not alter the underlying legal relationship or lease contracts between landlord and tenant um, and any guarantor that, that is there as well. So the code goes on to say that tenants who are in a position to pay should do so and um, you know should pay what they can or, or in full ideally if they can. Um, tenants who are unable to pay should seek agreement with their landlord to pay what they can and also landlords should consider a reasonable case put forward by a tenant in distress and provide to support to that tenant where possible while having regard to their own financial commitments. Uh, the code makes it clear that government support you know, was, provide, was, was provided and was done so on the basis it was used to sustain the business and to meet costs and one of those is, is of course rent. Um, the code applies to all business leases in all sectors and to any organisation negatively impacted by COVID-19. Um, both parties should consider the long-term viability of the business and consider renegoti renegotiating rent to ensure the continuation of viable businesses where possible. Um, the code's got four main principles. Um, we're running a bit short on time, so I won't go in, into them in depth, but basically in short they are transparency between the parties um, obviously a unified approach so collaboration um, government support obviously being taken into account obviously there's been a lot of government support and that needs to be considered um, you know how that's benefited you know both parties when when you're reaching an agreement and both parties acting reasonably and responsibly essentially um, third party mediators are encouraged when agreement cannot be reached between the parties and tenants speaking concessions should be clear with their landlords about why that concession is needed, including being prepared to provide financial information about their business. Um, likewise, landlords seeking to refuse concessions should be clear with their tenants why they cannot agree them, accompanied by a reasonable explanation. Um, and landlords should have consideration to the various factors when considering support for their tenant, including the duration of the closure period, the extra cost incurred by the tenant in protecting customers and staff, um, and the needs of other stakeholders such as banks, employees and suppliers. They should also consider the government support received by the tenant and how it has been used um, and the tenant's previous track record in relation to rent payments, amongst other factors. Um, suggestions for agreements given given in the code um, include moving to monthly payments instead of quarterly or paying in arrears, turnover rents or rental variations to reflect the current market, landlords drawing down on rent deposits held on account, uh, rent deductions or reductions, um, landlords waiving default interest on arrears, splitting the cost of rent for the closed period um, between the landlord and the tenant, reversionary leases, removal of break rights or an extension of the lease in return for a concession along the above lines. Um, so a whole sort of host of hopefully helpful ways to reach an agreement. Um, on, there is a small section on service charges and, and essentially tenants are encouraged to pay these in full to ensure the buildings continue to be insured and maintained during the pandemic. Um, the code acknowledges that actually extra costs may now be need to be, need to be incurred to ensure the buildings are COVID compliant. So we've seen that we've had to do more cleaning, we've had to install hand sanitizers, risk assessments, and obviously that does, of course, push the cost of the service charge up. Um, on, on the other hand, landlords should ensure that service costs are reduced where they can be reduced um, to provide best value for occupiers. So if, for example, there are services you can, you know, um, reduce slightly during the pandemic, then, you know, that should that should be done so that um, tenants are not, you know, unduly penalised. Um, and service charges, you know, could be spread over a shorter period, so monthly, just like rent, essentially. 
um, but reductions should be passed on to tenants as soon as possible. Um, and the code encourages um, you know, that that is done prior to the end of year reconciliation where it can be, um, where it can be done practically. So just to sort of wrap up, I suppose, um, I thought I'd give you some um, of our experience um, of, of the pandemic. Um, you know, generally landlords and tenants were largely adhering to this code before it was even thought up. And I don't really have a doubt that the market was the driver behind the principles of it. Um, it's testament, I think, to the adaptability of the industry that many parties were seeking to work together to overcome the crisis and to support each other anyway. And we certainly witnessed a great number of tenants making reasonable requests for monthly payment plans. And even those in arrears um, committing to pay all outstanding sums over an extended but agreed period. And on the whole, very few rent periods have been sought or granted. Um, largely tenants want to be able to meet their lease commitments um, and they just need the flexibility afforded by most landlords to assist their cash flow in the short term. Um, where a tenant has demonstrated a concession such as a rent free or a rent reduction would help sustain their business in the longer term, most of our clients have been supportive. This really has been the exception rather than the rule though, and we continue to see repayment plans agreed. Um, in some limited cases, small rent free periods have been agreed in return for the tenant relinquishing their break clause, um, extending the lease or agreeing to take a reversion release. It was recently reported that Monsoon, as an example, um, is planning to keep 57 more stores open than they initially planned um, after a whole raft of their landlords agreed to new turnover based rents. So there will potentially be a move towards these kind of lease structures going forwards. Some of the larger tenants have sadly um, frustrated the situation by taking extended periods to come up with proposals. So Travel Lodge is a well documented case, but unfortunately this is a reflection of the issue more generally. Um, with most of the larger companies we, we deal with having taken months to approach us to discuss the matter and reach agreements. And in some cases we still haven't even heard from them six months on. Um, and this has really not helped their case. Whilst undoubtedly they've got the unenviable task of reviewing significant portfolios and sites across the country, these delays in coming to the table have in some cases put serious strain on landlords' ability to meet their own commitments in the meantime. Um, when proposals have eventually been made, in most cases they are reasonable, in some cases they are completely unreasonable and would compromise the landlord's ability to support other tenants, um, and, some and in some cases those in more desperate need. So on the negative side, there have unquestionably been tenants taking advantage of the landlord's inability to pursue them for the arrears. And the key is distinguishing between those choosing not to pay and those which are you know, truly unable to pay. Um, furthermore, the code has come under criticism as being toothless. All the time, landlords have no other remedies available to them. Um, the tenant can effectively ignore the code without fear of real sanction. Um, it's also been criticised by landlords representatives that while the code demonstrates the ways in which the crisis has impacted tenants businesses, it does not demonstrate the ways in which a tenant's failure to pay the rent can have a financial impact on the landlord. Um, some have claimed it fails to overcome the imbalance between landlords and tenants respective negotiating positions, where on the one hand the, la the, the government has legislated against landlords, yet tenants are only subject to a voluntary code. Um, but anecdotal evidence does suggest that landlords have largely been willing to agree to um, and engage with and support tenants who have been honest and transparent. So the voluntary nature of the code may not be particularly useful when dealing with so-called rogue, uh, larger and well capitalised tenants who continue to ignore clear government advice to pay rent where they can and they should. So any change in their behaviour um, would rely solely on their moral compass rather than imposed on them by law. Um, but it does remain to be seen what will happen after the 30th of December. Um, so we can only really watch this space. Um, but thank you very much anyway. Uh, that's pretty much all from me. If anyone's got any questions, um, I think we were suggesting that perhaps you put them in the chats and Mark and I can go through them briefly. Um, I think we've probably only got about five minutes, but we can go through and pick some out perhaps and, uh, and come back to you. No, no questions. <laughs> I don't think I can see any. <laughs> OK, well, if there aren't any um, last minute questions, I think we can probably wrap up because the main stage is due to start, at, I believe, quarter to nine. So I've been asked to um, sort of clear this room by 
latest half past 22. So um, if you're all uh, happy with that, and as I say, there's no more questions to ask, then, then uh, we can uh, finish up and leave you to go to the main stage. Can I ask, can I ask, um, are, are there going to be slides available to participants? I, I'm certainly happy to make my slides available. Um, Mark, are you? Yes, yeah, no, I can make ours available. Plus, we've got Sue Foxley's uh, presentation, which is a more in-depth uh, analysis of the market. And uh, uh, those will be in the Kent Property Market Report, but we can check if hers were available. We obviously, we haven't seen them yet, but uh, I'm sure we can supply you anything you need. That's great, thank you. If you wanted to perhaps email or drop your email address to Mandy, then she could take a note of it. If you do that on the chat, Michael, then we can um, take a note of who specifically wants the slides and actually send you a copy over email. Um, so that might that might be a way of doing it. OK, so, oh, hang on, we've got some chats now. Good morning to you all. My name is Kureen. Um First of all, I would like to thank you, Charlotte and Mark, and also um, Ken Chamber for organizing such a wonderful uh, insight information. And I think you, not only you help us as an investor, but also you help the UK PLCs in a bigger market in terms of like investment, giving hope and giving direction that will uh, no doubt help our economy in a larger scale. And thank you very much. I just wanted to appreciate the fact that what you done and I thank you all for thank you. Yeah, such thank a you. wonderful thank you. <laughs>